thank you very much for the introduction. I think I, I have nothing to add uh, to that. Um, so yeah, this will be a mixture of a bunch of things. And so I've listed, so like the main theorem is stated here. And as you see, or maybe you don't even have, don't bother reading it. So there's like a bunch of notions from different areas. Like this is from graph theory. This is enumerative combinatorics. This is from logic model theory, actually like uh, not finite model theory, but the, the real model theory, infinite structures. This is the notion where, which arises from there. This is a, a notion from parametrized complexity. And so the main theorem connects many of those notions. So uh, if I had to first define all those notions and then state the theorem, then I don't know if I, I, I would manage to fit the theorem into this uh, lecture, so this talk. So that's why I decided to first write down the theorem. So I'm sure that at least it's stated. And now I'm gonna to try to go through those notions and explain them like in a piecemeal fashion so that uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, too much at one time. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, the, the thing that started, triggered this uh, whole story, which is enumerative combinatorics. So, This is uh, some old combinatorics where people try to count things, but as the name suggests, I don't really know this area. This is new to me, but uh, here's a, a well-known uh, conjecture from the 80s, in the late 80s, which is called the Stanley Wolf conjecture. Uh, and this, this conjecture says the following. If you have a class of permutations, so let's see the uh, class of permutations. So a permutation, I view it as a matrix where you have the rows and the columns ordered, or those are the rows, and, and then the matrix is labeled zeros and ones. I am just gonna draw the ones, so like, and in every row you have exactly one one and in every column you have exactly one one. So this is a permutation matrix. And we have a class of permutations that is closed under, uh, under sub permutations. So a sub permutation of a permutation is, uh, you, you remove an element and the, the row and the column that contain it and you obtain a new permutation. This is what you get. So you have a class of permutations that is closed under sub permutations and then, then the conjecture said that uh, either this class of permutations contains all permutations, then it's sort of boring, uh, this is just the class of all permutations. Or if it is not the class of all permutations, then um, it has not too many elements of size, permutations of size n. So the number of permutations of size n in this class is called the growth, the growth function. This means has growth at most two to the O of n. That means that there's at most two to the O of n, big O of n, uh, permutations of size n in the class. Um, okay, and this has triggered uh, a lot of research, and this was resolved by Marcus and Tardos. Um, okay, I'm going to write it here. So. Now this is a theorem, but uh, actually what Marcus and Tardos proved is a different statement than this one. By the way, when did I start? I just wanna keep track of the time. Was it like something, uh, 20 past, I guess, or something like that, yeah? Okay. So the Marcus and theorem, what they proved is the following statement from 2004. Um, Okay. Uh, it's a number 
t. There is a constant ct with the following property. If you take a matrix, let's say an n by n, 0, 1 matrix, so a matrix with entry 0, 1, but it doesn't have to be a permutation matrix. Uh, one of two cases holds. Uh, either either M has a few ones. So at most CT times M plus N, sorry, plus CT times N ones. Yeah. So it's sort of rather sparse. It has a linear number of ones, or M has a T by T grid miner. I'm going to draw this, what, what a grid miner is. So grid miner, I have in my N by N matrix, a T by T grid miner is, means that I can partition the rows and the, and the columns into T blocks. So a block is a, uh, a set of consecutive rows or columns. And here I have T blocks. And this partition is, is complicated in the following sense. In every, each of those squares like this, you will find at least one one. So there's at least one one in each of those zones. We will have like this complicated T by T pattern. T squared ones at least. Like, there could be many ones in other places as well, but every zone has at least, at least one, one one. So that's uh, the Marcus Tardos theorem. And it was earlier proved by Klazar, Martin Klazar in 2000, that this statement implies that statement. So, Okay, and this is this result is uh, the the beginning of of many results in enumerative com combinatorics. So, for example, uh, in those times, soon afterwards, Balog, Bolobas, Bolobash. And Morris, I think in 2006, they were trying to lift, generalize the Stanley Wilf conjecture to other classes of structures and have a result of similar type saying that either a class of structures, uh, like, uh, oh, so let me just point out one thing. If we have this statement of Stanley Wilf, what it says that if you have a class of permutations, then it has either contains all permutations, and then it means it has growth at least n factorial, or it has growth at most two to the O of n. Well, exactly n factorial it has it is the class of uh, all permutations. So this is a gap result. It says that there is no class. Well, n factorial is two to the omega of n log n. So there's a gap between this exponent O of n and omega of n and log n. And uh, this is the type of, one of the types of results that are of interest in enumerative combinatorics. And in particular, Ballard, Ballabas and Morris, they were trying to classify gaps in growth of classes of structures. So for example, they stated the following conjecture. Um, let C be a, Hereditary class uh, of ordered graphs. So, an ordered graph is a graph equipped with a linear order. So, left to right, say, and you have just some edges. This is an ordered graph. Class of ordered graphs is hereditary if it is closed under removing vertices. So, if I delete a vertex from a graph in the class, then the resulting ordered graph is still in the class. 
And we conjecture that there is a gap in a possible similar gap is there. Then C has growth two to the power of n, or has growth. Uh, well, and they predicted a very specific value, which is the sum over k from zero to n over two, n over two to be, n choose two k times k factorial. So they, they had a very precise conjecture about this growth, and uh, yeah, this might uh, seem ad hoc at first, um, but it's not. It's uh, this is precisely the growth of the class of ordered matching. So an ordered matching is you take a bunch of points and you split them into two parts, not necessarily of equal size. And you draw a matching between some of the points on the left and some of the points on the right. So this is the class of ordered partial matchings. And it's easy to see that the growth of this is and this number, well, the growth is the growth of the class is the number of structures in your class with n vertices. So if I have n vertices, then I have to first decide how many elements will be matched. It's a number k between n and n over two. And then I have to choose 2k such elements. And the first will be said to be on the left part, and the second k will be said to be on the right part. So I need to choose n out of n, I need to choose 2k elements, and then I just need to decide what matching I put between those k elements and those k elements. And there's k factorial of such matchings. So this is the growth of this class. And okay, so yeah, some questions? My question is if you would like to express this in the form two to the O two to the omega yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah, this is dominated by the last term of this. So this is at least n factorial. Uh, n choose two factorial, sorry. Which is still two to the omega of n mod n. Right. I, I I intended to write this, but I forgot. So thanks. Thanks a lot for this comment. But anyway, anyway, comments are very welcome. Jeff, did you have questions? Same question. Okay. Anybody else? Same question. Uh, okay. This is so it's a gap between at most exponential and they call this factorial growth. Yeah. Okay. So one of uh, like the consequences of our main theorem, which is this is here, one of those equivalents says, says if you look at it, it actually just says that this is true. So so this is. I'm not going to copy all those names all the, all the time, so I'm just going to just write star if it's uh, our result. Uh, so th this is true, and more precisely, I can say more. Mm. So there are two cases. Let's see the like above. So hereditary. Um, then either C contains one of 25 classes, each ha which has growth larger than this, or it has sub exponential growth or exponential growth. I'm going to list the 25 classes now. Mm. Okay, I, can, I guess I can remove this part. So it's, those are like 25 dis different generalizations of the class of all permutations. So one is the class of all uh, ordered matching, which was drawn here. Matchings. Another is the, the complements of this. 
edge components. So just replace edges with non-edges. Non Yet another one is you take the same picture as above, but whenever I had an edge in this picture, I also propagate this edge by moving the right endpoint to the right. Okay, so for every edge in the original uh, matching over here, I create those edges to the right of it. Then there's a dual one where, and this is like, so this was our partition. There are four variations of this all, all together for. So one is you take this edge and propagate it leftwards. And then there are the symmetric ones where you do it to the left. I have this edge and I move it leftwards and I move it rightwards. Okay, so those are uh, six classes of, so, and I do it for every edge and arm in my match, right? Those are six classes of structures, ordered graphs. Um, and uh, independently of those choices, I can additionally decide whether I create a clique on this left part or not, and whether I create a clique on the right part or not. So in each of those six options, I have uh, altogether four options, click, no click, click, no click. So those are, those are 24 classes. And so that means there's one missing, right? Because there was 25 over there. Uh, so the last one is um, the class of ordered permutation graphs. What's a permutation graph? I write a permutation and I, this, those are gonna be my vertices ordered from left to right. And I draw an edge if uh, the two vertices, two numbers are in the wrong order. So five and three are in the wrong order, uh, two and four in the right order, four and one. Yeah, and I guess I get a lot of something. Five, four. Five, four. Okay. Those are, and then you take the class of all permutations graphs, like permutation graphs like this. So you can, it's not difficult to see that actually each of those classes has uh, growth at least as big as this number. So the, the first class, which we have here, had this number. Some of them have exactly this number as growth. Some of them have slightly larger growth. This has large, much larger, this is n factorial instead of n choose two factorial. This is the growth of this class. But anyway, each of them has at least this growth. So in particular, this implies uh, the conjecture. Um, yeah, so the theorem says that unless you contain one of those 25 classes, then your growth is at most exponential. Okay. Mm. Yeah, moreover, one thing one could add is that each of those classes is minimal in the sense that um, any proper subclass of those classes has already exponential, which is uh, exponential growth, growth, which is at most exponential. Yeah. So, it's, um, okay. Mm. Is it easy to see or? Um, no, 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 it's not. Yeah, you, one, one way of showing this is that they're mutually incomparable. So none of them contains the other. And once you show this, which requires some argument, and you have this, uh, th then it follows from the statement that every class either uh, has at most exponential graph growth or contains one of those 24 classes, and they're incomparable. This means that uh, none of them contains a strictly smaller class with strictly, with super exponential growth. So that's that fault. Yeah, you, you need to do some argumentation. Yeah. 
Okay, maybe one more picture, which is maybe more illuminating in a sense. We have an, a similar statement for classes of matrices. So let C be a class of zero one matrices. Then C has growth not exponential or contains one of the following six classes. So what are the six classes? I take the class of all permutation matrices, permutation. That's one class. Another class is I take the complements, replace zeros with ones. So that means I replace those things by zeros. And the rest is ones. Yeah. Ones of the rest. Uh, and then you have four more classes. You take, you start with the permutation uh, matrix, and then you propagate the ones rightwards. So every you write fill it, fill in every entry to the right of a one with a one, or you do it downwards, leftwards, upwards. And so so those are six classes. Yeah. Those sort of correspond to those six options over here, apart from the parts where you decided whether you put a clique or not. And there was this one extra thing where there was this class of permutation graphs. Mm, okay. Mm, so far, so good. Okay. Um, okay, so that explains some items on this list. But yeah, the talk is about bounded twin width. So, what does twin width have to do with all of this? Well, it turns out that uh, this theorem and this dividing line, where you have classes of sub exponential growth and super exponential growth, this corresponds precisely to the notion of twin width, which was recently introduced, like two years ago. Mm by Edouard Bonnet and his co-authors. Okay, so I'm gonna maybe erase something like this. Yeah, so now I'm, go I'm gonna talk about twin width. Yeah, in general, I'm gonna talk like uh, about various conditions here. So if you phase out and uh, lose, uh, uh, concentration for a couple of minutes, then you can wake up in a, a few minutes later, and I'm going to talk about something completely different. And so then it's, there's another chance to uh, catch up, and there there will be many chances to catch up. So we can feel free to sleep uh, for a long time, and you can if you want. It's uh, <laughs> not obligatory. Uh, okay, so now now I'm going to describe this notion of a twin width, which turns out to be the key to obtaining this, this, uh, this result, which on the face of it doesn't talk about twin width. That's nice. Uh, but yeah, the twin width is uh, a very interesting notion. So I'm, I think it's worth mm, seeing it, it if you haven't seen it yet. Um, OK, so this is. Okay, I'm going to define the notion of a twin of twin width for let's say first for just uh, simple graphs, undirected graphs, unordered graphs. So I have a graph G, simple, undirected, unordered. This notion, this is a width parameter which tells you how you can construct uh, G in some sort of iterative way. And uh, the idea is as follows. So, um, so G has twin with at most T if the following holds. So uh, I have a sequence of partitions. Those are the partitions of the vertex set. Mm. 
The first partition is a partition into singletons. So my vertex set is just every vertex in a, sing is in a single part of the partition. This is my vertex set. What happens in each step? I take my partition from the previous step. I have a partition in the previous step and I merge two parts. So PI plus one is obtained by merging some two parts into one part. And I'm, I end with the partition with one part. That's not the end because it doesn't mention the parameter T at all. So there's something missing. And um, what is missing? The condition is that at each step, I look at any part of the partition and I draw a red edge between two parts. If those two parts, the behavior between those two parts is not homogeneous. So two parts are homogeneous if either there's no edges between them or you have all possible edges between them. And if it's not homogeneous, I draw a red edge. And the requirement is that every part has at most T outgoing, outgoing red edges. So every part is every part is homogeneous to all but at most t other parts. So that means I have t exceptions and this part apart from those exceptions is homogeneous to everybody else. So it's either fully adjacent or fully non-adjacent to everybody else. in this partition and, th and this holds for every each of those partitions. That's the definition of twin of twin with Any questions. Okay, maybe simple example. If you haven't seen this, oh, I don't want to erase the name here, so um, I can erase this. So here's an example. Let's look at a path. And so I'm going to draw this sequence of partitions. Initially, we have the partition where every vertex is in a single part. And I need to iteratively merge two parts with each other. So I merge, for example, those two into one part. And oh, maybe I should have said in the very beginning when I have this partition in singletons, any two parts were homogeneous with, each other, with respect to each other, because if, if you have singletons, then they're either connected or they're not connected. But in particular, this part is fully adjacent to this part, or it's fully non-adjacent, for example, to this part. Now, if I merge those two parts into one, then something uh, interesting happens. Then I have this red edge, because this part is no longer homogeneous to this guy. This one is adjacent to it, and this one is non-adjacent to it. So I have a red edge between those, this part. But this part is fully non-adjacent to this one, this one, this one, and this one. So I don't have any further red edges. So I have one red edge. And I repeat this process. I merge those two guys. And now this part is not homogeneous with respect to this one, but it's homogeneous to, with respect to all other guys. And I continue. And so on. And so on. And so on. And I get a partition with single, a single part. And at every step, every part had at most red outgoing edge. So the twin with is at most one. Um, okay, maybe I can do one more example because I think it's. Yeah. Any question? Uh, so here, if you should take any sequence of partitions on the, on the path, you're going to have degree bounded by two, right? The red degree. If those are like partitions into intervals, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So maybe uh, just a quick other example. Let's take a tree. And uh, well, I start with the partition into singletons. I'm not going to draw it. Draw it. Um, start first. 
merge those two parts, those two, this singleton with this singleton. Now, this part is not, well, it's, uh, it is homogeneous with this part because it's adjacent and with every other part as well because it's not adjacent to anybody else. Okay, now I have this part with two elements. I merge it with this guy. And it's, again, it's a part which is homogeneous with this one. Uh, so far, so good. I merge this, okay. Uh, it's okay. Now I merge all of those together. Now there's something uh, going on because I have a part which is not homogeneous with respect to this root. The root is connected to this one of the elements, but not connected to the, to the rest. So this, the edge between this part and this part is left. Okay, and uh, what do we do now? Well, I guess we do the same stuff here. We merge it bigger and bigger parts, and then eventually we get this part in one subtree, which is not homogeneous to this uh, to the root. And now what we do is we merge those two parts together. And now it's one part, which is not homogeneous to the root. Okay, and then we take care of this subtree. Now it becomes not homogeneous with respect to the root. And then we merge those two parts together and we get a single part, which is not homogeneous to the root. So uh, repeating this, we get our desired sequence and at most, there are always at most Two outgoing, two red edges outgoing from any given part of the sequence. So the twin with that is at most two for trees. Okay, I maybe should mention that co-graphs are exactly those which have twin width at most zero. If you know what a co-graph is, then you probably can easily check this. This is easy to see. If you don't know what a co-graph is, then you can take this as a definition or forget it. Uh, and uh, another example is graphs of bounds. Uh, so maybe I should put it this way. The twin width of a graph is bounded in terms of its tree width. So if I have a graph of small tree width, then it's also going to have bounded small twin width. And also it's bounded by some, in terms, like in terms of, some, there's some function which uh, needs to, needs to uh, maybe, I don't know what the function is. Anyway, there exists a function. Also, you could do the same thing with click -width. So in other words, graphs of bounded click -width have bounded twin width. And we're actually not interested in the precise values of the, Twin width, but we are interested in classes which have bounded twin width, like the whole class has bounded twin width. So classes of bounded click width are examples of this, but there's many more examples. And for example, planar graphs also have bounded. Uh, so the class of planar graphs uh, has bounded twin width. But it's actually not so easy to describe this process for planar graphs. And for that, you use a different equivalent characterization, which is uh, related to this Marcus Tadlos theorem. So I'm going to. So this is like one of the main results of this uh, twin width theory from uh, the first paper in the series. So the twin width one paper. Uh, it says that the following is. Uh, conditions are equivalent for a class of graphs. He has bounded twin width. And the second condition is that there is some number t such that every graph in the class uh, has an order on the vertices with the following property. 
where you look at the adjacency matrix of the, of the graph along this order. So yeah, so we look at the matrix along this order. And this matrix uh, is not supposed to be very complicated. This means that um, um, there is no partition where you partition the rows and the columns into T blocks each. that each zone is complicated and now complicated means slightly different something slightly different than here it means that um, no zone is just the same row repeated many times and um, is not the same column repeated many times so that means that every zone is um, has more than one row And more than one column. That means that the partition is complicated. So I'll write it this way. Distinct rows. So like we look, at, we compare the rows and check if they're equal, like coordinate-wise equal. And they're not supposed to be all the same, the same row repeated many times, and they're not supposed to be the same column repeated many times. And if we had a partition like this into T blocks here and T blocks here, where you have that each zone is complicated in this sense, then you say that this partition is complicated. And the requirement is that there is an order such that there is no com complicated partition. So there is some order where the adjacency ma metric, the matrix is simple in some sense. Okay, that's the condition. So maybe I'm going to give a, an example illustrating this. Because uh, it gets some number of alternating quantifiers in this statement. Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to show that planar graphs have found the twinness, but I'm going to look at Hamiltonian planar graphs. So a Hamiltonian planar graph is a graph which has a Hamiltonian path. So it looks like, like this, but there are some additionally, there are some edges and it's a planar graph. So I can draw it like this, like a planar, it's a planar, oh, this is the same edge. I'm not gonna draw it. Uh, okay, maybe it's enough. This is a Hamiltonian planar graph. And uh, what I wanna show is that there is some order which has some good properties. So what, what order I'm, am I going to take? Well, surprise, surprise, it's going to be the order as in this picture. So now I want to check that it has this good property. So uh, I need to show that there's some no number t. And I guess I'm going to take t equals 6. And what is the property supposed to be? That th I want to say that there's no partition of the adjacency matrix into six parts. Well, the rows are partitioned into six parts. The columns are partitioned into six parts. And each of those zones has uh, at least two different rows and at least two different columns. I want to show that this leads to a contradiction. That's that means I've shown this condition holds for t equals six and for this order. Um, actually, I'm going to show something stronger. So if, if it, a zone has at least two different rows and has at least two different columns, that means it cannot be the, the zone which has only zeros, because zeros has only uh, all rows are the same and all columns are the same. So I'm actually going to show something stronger. The, there's no partition like this, where you have six blocks here, six here such that in each of those zones, there's a one in a similar way as, as it was in the Marcus Halder series. So I'm actually gonna show that uh, this has no six by six grid minor, which is a stronger condition that, than that condition. 
So uh, suppose it does have a six by six grid miner. Um, okay, so let's look at um, the middle vertex here and the middle vertex here. So one of them is to the left than the other in this, in this picture. So in particular, I guess this means that um, what I want to show, uh, this partition is not necessarily symmetric, right? This partition is not necessarily symmetric, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So I can, um, right. So that means that if I take, well, either this interval and this interval are non overlapping in the picture, or this interval and this interval are non overlapping in the picture. So suppose this interval and this interval are non overlapping in the picture. So this is maybe I'm going to use two different colors. Um, and maybe this is going to be confusing. So this is this interval. And this is this interval, and they're non overlapping in the picture. Okay. So what I have here, and I look at this this part of the adjacency matrix. And what it tells me is that I can partition this blue interval into three segments. And I can partition the red interval into three segments. And if I look at any of those red, three red segments, and any of the blue, three blue segments, say this one and this one, then there's a one. So if I take this interval, sub interval, and for example, this one, I have an edge connecting them. Okay, so what, what does that mean? I have those three intervals here, I have those three intervals here, and for any pair of them, I have an edge connecting this interval with this one, this one with this one, this one with this one, and observe that each of those subgraphs is connected because we have this path, this Hamiltonian path, which witnesses. So that means I have a K6 mine, right? And this is not possible. K33. <laughs> Oops. Uh, that's not possible, right? Still. <laughs> Uh, okay, that's a contradiction. So this order with t equals six works means we cannot. There's no possibly possible way to partition this into six blocks this way and this way, so that we have a one in each of them, which is stronger, a strong, even stronger condition than the one that we need. Okay, so Hamiltonian planar graphs have uh, the property that we need. Planar graphs also I'm, have this. I'm not going to prove it. I'm just going to tell you how how you can get the order. Take a DFS tree. Of, the, of your graph, rooted at some vertex, and then traverse this tree by always taking the rightmost, like you pick an orientation, you, you pick a planar embedding of your graph, and then you always take the right turn in the DFS tree. So you always go to the rightmost neighbor that hasn't been visited yet, and this gives you. Um, an order on all those vertices, and you can verify this requires a more involved argument that this order is also good. I don't know if t equals six works, maybe t equals six still works, not sure. Um, okay. So this is a good order for planar graphs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to talk about ordered graphs and the twin width of ordered graphs. And so far I have defined the twin width of unordered graphs. So one should say that this notion just generalizes to arbitrary binary structures. So a binary structure is, a, is just a base ground set, A, equipped with one or more binary relations. Okay. 
each of them is a binary relation. So a graph is a binary structure where we just have one relation, which is the adjacency relation. But an ordered graph is also a binary structure. We have two relations. One is the order, uh, one is the adjacency relation, and the other one is the order. Which one is smaller than which one? That's a binary structure, but in general, you could have other binary structures like directed graphs, ordered directed graphs, would, but not. And so, uh, so now we can define the same notion for uh, binary structures. Just take the same definition, but now just the notion of homogeneity needs to be explained. When are two parts homogeneous? Well, if all the binary relations behave the same way between any two pairs of vertices. So like if you have one binary re relation, which is like red edges, for example. So either you have red edges going from every vertex here to every vertex here, or you have none of those red edges going in this direction. And similarly in the other direction. And, um, and this is the same for all of those. Oh, red might have been the wrong choice because we had red here. But yeah, you get the idea. Yeah, so every relation has to behave in the same way uh, between those two parts. And that's what it means that two parts are homogeneous, and then you can just copy paste the same definition. So this theorem, uh, this definition still makes sense. And then you can, this theorem also lifts to binary structures. So then you can have the same statement for uh, classes of binary structures. And so a class of binary structures has bounded twin width if blah, 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 the same holds, but now you need to define what is the adjacency matrix of the binary structures. And like in a, the adjacency matrix of a graph was where you put a one or a zero depending on whether or not two vertices are adjacent. So if I have two vertices U and V, then I put a one or a zero depending on whether they belong to the adjacency relation or not. And in general, you just put a bit vector which tells me, does this pair uh, belong to the first relation, the second relation, and so, and so on. So like you put, you label this entry with an entire bit vector, although you think of it as, as an element of an alphabet, which tells you all the information about all the relations. So it's just, it's gonna be a matrix over an alphabet whose elements are bit vectors of length K, where K is the number of binary relations. That's the adjacency matrix. And then you have the same theorem. So this all lifts. So now some, I can state some more examples uh, about of classes of bounded twin width. For example, uh, whole sets of bounded width. So a whole set is, an, is not a graph. It's a, you can see it as a directed graph. I'm not talking about the cover graph. So it's, the transitive, it's a transitive relation, which has bounded width. So, okay. Not the thing, but yeah. Those that are bounded width as binary structures, they have bounded twin width. Um, yeah, and another one, which is maybe coming back to the Stanley Wolf uh, story, is permutations excluding a fixed subpermutation. Uh, so, um, yeah, may maybe I'm not going to go into this. So you can view a permutation as a binary structure, uh, at least in two ways. For example, if you look at this matrix, then you can view it as a set. This one is with five elements equipped with two linear orders, according to the uh, x-axis and the y-axis. So it's a set equipped with two binary relations. For example, if you have a class, a permutation excluding a fixed sub-permutation, sub viewed as a binary relation like this, then it has bounded twin width. Okay. Um, so how much time do I have, by the way? It's- uh, An hour fast. Sorry? I'm an hour. Okay. Okay, so maybe I'm, I'll get somewhere. Um, okay, so now there's, uh, my main, fo my main focus is on ordered graphs of uh, so now there's one subtlety where you can get easily confused. If I have an ordered graph, so what's an ordered graph? Vertices, edges, and well, it has vertices and those two binary relations, the edges and the less or um, less um, relations, smaller relations. It's an ordered graph. Mm. 
And there's this theorem which says that this ordered graph has small twin width, if and only if you can find this order on this graph, which has some certain good property. Well, the, the thing to remember is that this order doesn't have to be the same order as in the graph, it can be a different order. So we just treat this relation here as an abstract relation, R, which happens to be an order. That's the notion of twin width that you're uh, gonna apply here to this relation, uh, to this structure to find out whether it has bounded twin or not. And this theorem says that you can order it in some way, it doesn't have to be the same way as, as this order. So that's uh, one thing which is not so nice. And um, one of the results of uh, our paper is that you can fix this discrepancy. So this makes things nicer. Um, so the following are equivalent for a class of ordered graphs. So it's going to be the same statement. But uh, the second item is going to be tweaked a bit. Actually, it's, I think it's going to be made a bit nicer because this condition says that there's, uh, there's an order such that whenever you take a partition into T blocks, then it's not going to be the case that each of those zones has uh, more than one row or uh, and has more than one column. Uh, so the condition is going to be replaced by there is there are two numbers k and t in n of that every graph in the class. Now I'm going to use the order of this graph. So for every, I'm going to write it this way. Such that for every graph with its order, there is no partition which is complicated. So there is no partition like this, where now the notion of complication becomes a bit more complicated. So it's a partition into T blocks and T blocks here. And each zone has more than K rows and more than K columns. Where this means that it's a complicated partition. And now the statement is there's no partition into T blocks like this, like this, where every zone is complicated. Yeah? But you take the order of the graph. So this is. Um, I think a slightly improved version of this statement. Okay. Yeah. And so moreover, there's one thing that I should have added and I forgot to add. It's one important uh, problem in this theory of twin width. There's uh, no algorithm, no known approximation algorithm, which would tell you what, what is the twin width of a given structure. So if you're given a graph of small twin width, you want to find such a, Contractions, this is called a contraction sequence, sequence of partitions. We don't know how to do this in polynomial time. Okay. Maybe it's a quick question that I want to be sure that twin width is just the property of the end. Like there's no like. And the order as well. Uh, but now I'm talking about yeah. structures equipped with two relations, one of which happens to be, be a linear order. But I do understand. Okay. And now I'm talking about the twin width of this binary structure uh, viewed not as a graph, but as an ordered graph. So the notion of, tw of twin width is lifted to binary structures. Oh, I see. And this is how this structure is viewed. So yeah, so the order is plays an important role. So like coming back to this picture, um, I put two parts. Okay, so I can explain this notion of homogeneity in this particular case, because when are two parts homogeneous? Well, in the order, one has to be completely to the left than the other one, and they have to be fully adjacent or fully non-adjacent. 
That's when two parts are homogeneous. Otherwise, they're not homogeneous and I put a rabbit. And I have to have a sequence of partitions where every part is not homogeneous to at most T parts. Yeah. So that's the notion of uh, bounded twin nodes for a class of ordered graphs. And, and now the condi second condition is with respect to this order. Okay, so I should have, uh, meant, as I mentioned, we know no polynomial time algorithm that when you're given a graph of bounded twin width will actually compute in polynomial time a, part, a sequence of partitions like this of bounded width. This is not known, but uh, what we prove is that if you're given an ordered graph of bounded twin width, then we can compute a sequence of partitions like that in polynomial time. So there's an approximation algorithm which computes uh, the twin width in polynomial time. So, so when you say approximation algorithm, Sorry, approximate. When you say approximation algorithm, what is the approximation algorithm? It's just some function. Yeah, so, so it computes, if you're given a graph of twin width T, it computes a uh, um, contraction sequence of width F of T for some function in polynomial, in time, something like cubic time. Yeah, independent of the twin. Okay. Um, so now, okay, to prove this theorem, the equivalent, uh, we tweak a bit. Well, this requires some new ideas, the proof from twin with one, which used, so in particular, we use the Marcus Tardos theorem in the proof of this statement. Okay. Um, and this condition here is said that we, we say that this means that C has bounded grid rank. What we mean by this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to our main theorem and let's see what we've covered so far. And then I can wake up some of you if uh, because we're going to move to some next. Items. So, what have we covered? We we discussed the notion of bounded twin width, bounded grid rank. Those are equivalent. That's what that theorem says. We said that okay. So, um, growth. We've explained what a growth means, and it was proved in the twin width one paper that if a class C has bounded twin width, then it has growth at most exponential. So at least one implication was proved uh, already before that. The other implication wasn't proved. Um, okay, so there's a couple of items that, so we, we've covered the 25 classes. You know what unbounded twin width means. Okay, so what is the shape of this theorem is in general is like, we have some positive conditions which are equivalent to having bounded twin width and we have some negative conditions which are equivalent to unbounded twin width. Um, okay, so maybe let's discuss FO model checking since we're in the computer science department. So we should, Talk something about algorithms. Oh, I mentioned algorithms already. So, what is FO model checking? Um, So it's the, the following problem. You're given a structure, for example, a graph, and a formula, which is a first order formula. And you want to decide does phi hold? And here's a, like a very simple example. Here's a formula. CNFO so far. It says there are k vertices which are initially adjacent. And so this is the formula which expresses that given a graph, uh, there's a k click in the graph. And the aim is to solve this problem. This problem which is I'm going to write FO model checking. We would like to solve it in time, some function of the formula 
times the polynomial in the size of the graph. But the exponent should not depend on the formula. This is called FPT time, fixed parameter intractable time. And um, well, it is conjectured that already the clique problem cannot be solved in such time. So uh, this cannot hold in general unless, uh, well, there's this, unless something bad happens in parameterized complexity, which is, this is the bad thing, which people don't expect to happen. AW star equals FPD. Mm, so we cannot do this. But we can do it in some special cases. So we can have such a um, algorithm which runs in FPT time on various classes. For example, it is known that we can do this on graphs which are planar. Then it exists. Or of graphs of bounded tree width. Or classes which exclude a fixed minus. What else was known? It was known that we can do it on post sets of bounded width. So for all such classes, it is known that there exists an algorithm which solves the model checking problem in FPT time. Uh, another, so there's, there's a rich theory uh, around the notion of nowhere denseness. And for all nowhere dense classes, such an algorithm exists. And so one, one further thing, what was proved in the twin with one paper is that you can solve the FO model checking problem in FPT time on classes of bounded twin width, uh, but only if you're given the contraction sequence. So given a contraction sequence. A contraction sequence is the sequence of partitions in the definition. So if you're just given the graph, uh, then we don't know how to solve the um, model checking problem on this graph. But if you're given the graph together with the contraction sequence of bounded width, then we do know how to solve the model checking problem. And this is one with one. OK. No, no, this is only then we know how to do it. We don't know how to do it in general. OK, so and this also holds for not necessary classes of graphs, but binary structures. So combined with what I said earlier, that for ordered graphs, we can actually find the approximation algorithm in polynomial time. And with this theorem from twin with one, that means that for ordered graphs of bounded twin width, we can actually drop this assignment over here. So we don't need the contraction sequence because we can compute it in form of time. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so we have this corollary. Um, let me write it here. OK, before I write this corollary, let me go back to this list again. So uh, I've discussed the equivalence of having bounded twin width and bounded grid rank. This is what I just raised. I didn't, and it, the proof uses Marco Stavros. Uh, so now what we do is if we have a class of unbounded twin width, then we know that it has unbounded grid rank. And that means that you can find certain complicated patterns based on this in your graph, in your ordered graphs. And then we apply some Ramsey theorem theory to this. You, we make those classes more and more regular. And then we end up with one of, we see that we have to have contain one of 25 classes. So if we have unbounded twin width, and this proves that C contains using Ramsey theorem theory, uh, C contains one of those 25 classes that we had in the beginning. And each of those 25 classes actually does have unbounded twin width. This is actually quite, uh, you can argue that in an elementary fashion, 
uh, for each of the 25 classes separately. So this is an equivalence here. Each of those classes has growth at least uh, as big as that. So this proves this implication. And we knew from twin width one that if a class has bounded twin width, then it has at most exponential growth. So, that, so this way, that means we also have an equivalence here. Okay, and furthermore, if our class has bounded twin width, then as I said, you can um, compute this contraction sequence in polynomial time, and then using the results from twin width one, we can solve FO model checking in FD, FPT time on C, even if the, contract, if the contraction sequence is not given on it. So this proves the implication to five. Uh, on the other hand, you can check uh, by hand for each of those 25 classes that FO model checking is not FPT on those classes. I mean, it is hard on those classes. It, it is as hard as on each of those classes and as it is on the class of all graphs. So this proves the implication from two to five prime. Okay, so let's see how I'm on, I'm standing with time. Yeah, okay, so it's, there's a bit more time. So there's two more notions that I haven't explained yet. C is monadically an IP and C interprets the class of all graphs. Yeah, and this is, uh, okay, so the, uh, if you have slept so far, you, you can now wake up. Uh, the rest can go to sleep, like we can take, you can do it in rounds. So there's at least one person awake at any moment. <laughs> so uh, what is this notion of monadically an IP? Well, this is an interesting notion in that it uh, generalizes all those notions that we have seen so far. So, and it listed here. So, planar graphs, bounded tree with lower dense classes, bounded twin, and so on. So, we're going to discuss this notion. And it's a notion which comes from model theory. It was actually introduced by Shella in the 80s. So, Shella is the like the, the king of model theory. Um, okay, so then I'm, let me explain. Oh, okay. Let me just mention before I go to monadic and IP classes. So I, I was mentioning that there's this line of research where we have FPT algorithms for the model checking problem on various classes and it's, uh, built around this notion of nowhere denseness. So before I go to monadic and IP, let me just mention one theorem related to that and to mod modulate this notion of future theorems. This is the theorem of Groet, Kreutzer, and Siebert. I think it's I think it's something like 2016, I'm not sure. Um, so suppose you have a class of graphs, now normal graphs without borders, which is monotone. So closed under removing vertices and edges. So the theorem says, if C is nowhere dense, I'm not going to define this notion, but just write this theorem. Then FO model checking is FPT on C. Otherwise, FO model checking is hard. <laughs> on monotone graph classes, this precisely captures the notion, the coincides with the tractability of the model checking problem, this notion of nowhere density. And now observe that as a corollary of uh, what I have said, um, we have a similar statement for ordered graphs. Let's see the uh, class, a hereditary class, just close under removing vertices of ordered graphs. And we have the same. If C is has down the twin width, the model checking is FPT. Uh, 
Otherwise, it is AW star hot. Okay, so we have two different theorems which precisely characterize the tractability of the model checking problem. Once in the setting of monotone graph classes, once in the setting of hereditary classes of ordered graphs. So one would like to generalize this uh, and have a notion which uh, combines the two, right? And so this notion, this motivates this notion, maybe this is the right thing. So what is monadic and IP? Okay, so first, uh, how do I want to present this? Okay. So this is involves first order logic. So I have a first order formula with two free variables. And I have a structure, let's say a graph or a bipartite graph or whatever, a structure S is a structure. And then I can define a bipartite graph. I'm going to denote it this way based on phi and S. What is this bipartite graph? And let's say this structure is G. I'm going to have two copies of the vertices of G on the left and on the right. I have the vertices of G. And I put an edge in my bipartite graph if phi holds for A and B. And if I have a vertices C and D where phi does not hold, then I don't get an edge. That's the bipartite graph associated, defined by phi and g. Okay. So now, if I have a class of graphs or structures, then I can define. Can I look? I can look at all bipartite graphs obtained in this way. From all elements of my structure, and this is a class of bipartite graphs. And I say that the formula phi is NIP. That's it, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, phi is not NIP on C if this class of bipartite graphs avoids some fixed finite bipartite graph as an induced subgraph. So if this class omits some um, bipartite graph uh, as in this subject. So that, that means there exists some fixed phi such that, so there exists an F, sorry, there exists a fixed bipartite graph F such that for every graph or every element in my structure, F is not an induced subgraph of the bipartite graph defined by phi and g. Okay. So let me give it, give a simple example of this. Suppose the formula is, is the equality formula. Then no matter what my original graph is, if it has n vertices, then the bipartite graph defined by it is just the matching with n vertices. And this avoids this bipartite graph as an induced subgraph. So phi is NIP on the class of all graphs. I could also take the formula phi of xy, which is x not equal to y. And this just defines the co-matching, which avoids this bipartite graph as an induced subgraph. So this formula is also an IP on the class of all graphs. Um, but we can, for example, look also at the, let's look at the formula, which is the edge formula. And um, now this formula is not an IP on the class of all graphs, because if I just apply this formula to the class of all graphs, then I will, will obtain the class of all bipartite graphs, essentially. So this is not, not an IP on the class of graphs. 
But it's not difficult to check that it is an IP on the class of planar graphs. And this is because this bipartite graph, which is K33, is uh, not a subgraph of any bipartite graph obtained by the adj adjacency relation applied to any planar graph. So this formula is NIP on the class of all planar graphs. Okay, so that's, um, those are some examples. Then we say that a class of graphs C is NIP if every formula is NIP on C. Okay, so the class of all graphs is not an IP because the edge relation is not an IP on C, but uh, there are classes which are an IP. Like for example, the class of graphs with no edges, it is an IP. It's not, it's not a very interesting class. Or the class, class of all cliques. There's one more notion, uh, which I'm gonna write C, well, this is monadic in IP. C is monadic in IP. If every coloring of C is an IP. So I have to say C is a class of graphs. Now, what is a coloring of C? You fix a bounded number of colors, like three colors, and you color, you consider all graphs from your class colored with those three colors arbitrarily. Now it's a class of colored graphs. Now, if you have a class of colored graphs, then your formulas can potentially express more. They can say that a vertex is green or a vertex is blue or red. But it's still supposed to be an IP, even if this formula has access to the colors. So C is monadically an IP, even if after adding some colors and having access to those colors in your formulas, you still remain an IP. That's the definition of monadic and IP. And so let's uh, give two suggested examples. So there's a theorem from actually from 78, I think, way before the notion of the nowhere denseness was introduced, uh, which proves that all nowhere dense classes are monadic and IP. Every nowhere dense class is monadic. And nowhere dense classes include, uh, let me, they include planar graphs, bounded tree with graphs, or well, nowhere dense are those by definition, exclude minor classes. They don't include poses of bounded twin uh, width or graphs of bounded twin width in general. But those things are nowhere dense. So for example, the class of planar graphs is monadically an IP by this theorem. So not only this formula, the edge relation is an IP on the class of planar graphs, but every first order formula is, is an IP on the class of planar graphs. Okay, and one more thing. Um, this is from the twin width one paper. Every class of bounded twin width Is monadic. Also, you might wonder how was this previous theorem proved before the notion of nowhere denseness was introduced? Well, they discovered it independently there in 78. The notion of twin uh, nowhere denseness was introduced later in the 2000s by Neshechli and Nasolatelem. So every class of bounded twin width also is monadic. Yeah, so. This theorem, uh, well, those two theorems and those two theorems suggest that this might be the right generalization of the two results above. And maybe let me just finish here with this conjecture, which so let me write. Um, this is, I think, well, it's, it's been implicit in the community. I think it dates around 2016 or something like that. No, maybe later. I don't know. Um, many names, many people have been discussing this. So the conjecture says 
if you have a class which is hereditary and it's a class of graphs, then model checking, special model checking is FPT on C, if and only if C is monadically state, then monadically an IP. Yeah, okay, I'll just, uh, just two more things to add before we finish. So what is the status of this conjecture? So first of all, you could also replace, instead of having hereditary class of graphs, you could have hereditary class of arbitrary structures. So this theorem proves this conjecture in the special case of ordered graphs. The theorem above proves this conjecture in the special case of classes which are not only hereditary, but are moreover monotone. Um, but this conjecture is already open for classes which have bounded twin width. So remember that every class of bounded twin width is monadically an IP, but we don't know whether FO model checking is FP fixed parameter tractable on every bounded twin width class. We only know it for classes of ordered graphs. So this is open for even for, for classes of bounded twin width. And it is also open for classes which are so called interpretations of nowhere dense classes. What is an interpretation? If you have a formula phi, again with two free variables and a graph G, then you can define a different graph than the one defined previously. It has the same vertices as G instead of having two copies, and you put an edge between them if and only if phi holds. Now, so the difference is that you just smash the two copies. It's not a bipartite graph. And then you look at all graphs that you can obtain this way from a given class and a fixed formula. And this class is called an interpretation of this class. So this class is an interpretation of C. And then you can fix a formula phi, take a nowhere dense class, and you get an interpretation of a nowhere dense class, which is still monadically an IP, but we, know, we don't know how to do model checking on those classes. Yeah, so this is the status of this conjecture. Let me finish here, and thanks for your attention.